The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Good evening and welcome to my state of mind. I am Dan York. You're watching this program originally on a Wednesday evening and we're going to talk to the new speaker elect tonight, Joe Shikarchi, who has a wonderful disposition, but a big challenge ahead of him. He wins the speakership now that the Speaker of the House, Nick Mattiello, has lost his race in District 15 and will be retiring, at least temporarily, from politics. We'll brief you on the politics and the coverage of the Democratic Caucus, and then we'll get right into it with Joe Shikarchi. This is not going to be easy. I think, I think Joe Shikarchi has got a situation where he's got to rebuild the General Assembly uh, almost from scratch based on how they've walked away from three branches of government responsibility during this pandemic. Some tough questions coming up for the Speaker-elect of the House. In a socially distanced caucus in the Warwick Crown Plaza, Representative Joe Shikarchi winning 54 votes for Speaker out of the 65 Democrats in the new caucus. Representative Chris Blesjewski picked for Majority Leader. My door is always open. I will always answer the call. I will always return the text. I will always get back to you. Shikarchi, who, as the current majority leader, was Mattiello's number two, won support of representatives who voted against Mattiello in 2018. Under his leadership, the days of being bullied and ostracized will be over. Afterwards, saying he made no promises to get those votes. I didn't commit to anybody or chairmanships or positions or offices. I think the broad base of support I enjoy tonight is the relationships that I had made over the last eight years in the House. Democrat Leanna Kassar also threw her hat in the ring for speaker, though she didn't attend the caucus, saying it should have been virtual due to COVID concerns. She voted by proxy for herself, but did not garner any other votes. It's unclear now if Mattiello, who remains in office until January, will continue to preside over the upcoming budget negotiations and special session to consider the budget as a lame duck speaker, or if he will turn the gavel over to Shikarchi. Shikarchi says everything is on the table to try and close the sizable budget gap estimated at roughly $900 hundred million dollars last spring from a change to the car tax phase out to even recreational marijuana. Literally uh, well, everything is on the table uh, whether it might be unfortunately some kind of uh, tax increase or some kind of layoffs or possibly even uh, you know some kind of a reduction in spending. And so we meet the new speaker elect Joe Shikarchi. Uh, speaker congratulations on your new job. Thank you very much. Always good to talk to you. And always good to come on your show Dan. Is it, uh, is this going to be a uh, be careful what you ask for type of thing? Uh, biting off a lot. Uh, chewing is going to be difficult. It, it is. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. But yes, it's, it is quite a lot going on right now in a short amount of time in the middle of a pandemic and, of, uh, and, and hopefully trying to get a budget done as well. Well, you know, I, I, I say that, but I don't think it's any secret to you that I have been very, very critical of the General Assembly's leadership decisions during this entire time. I mean, I, I'm not going to mince any words. I think it's been an absolute disgrace that this, uh, that this General Assembly has taken the powder that it has. Uh, emergency authorization from the governor early on seemed wholly appropriate. Uh, I know that uh, this, this unicameral activity between the Senate and the House, uh, uh, you know, feigned oversight, but I don't see it. Uh, we've got a governor right now who's uh, doing the best she can, but uh, listens to her own voice more than anything else, is threatening economic lockdown uh, again, which is going to be a disaster for the state. Um, there's no oversight right now. There's no checking and balancing. Uh, are you going to jump into this thing, not only as the speaker, but are you going to bring this General Assembly back to any formidable role here? Or are we just going to roll a, a, an autonomous government for, for the time being? Uh, I can tell you that oversight, uh, I'm convening the House Oversight Committee this Thursday. We're going to have several oversight meetings, and it's my goal to bring the General Assembly back in session before Christmas. Uh, hopefully to enact a budget and to uh, authorize some bond spending, uh, at least authorization of them. That would be my goal to accomplish. But the oversight is happening this Thursday afternoon. Uh, I believe Dr. Alexander Scott's the first one. The second oversight hearing will have the spending and what has been spent, why, how come, what hasn't been spent, what's the justification. I think I'm going to have the Department of Administration from the Governor, the Budget and the Commerce Department all answering questions uh, under the oversight commission from the house side. Well, that's good news. That's that's progress. Uh, it's got to happen. I, 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 you know, 
I, I wonder what your perspective is. I mean, we're already seemingly right in the middle of the sandwich here. I mean, we're, get, we're, we're getting right into it. I, I'll talk to you about the aesthetics of the job and all that kind of stuff a little bit later in the show here. But uh, it, it seems like a, a, not only do we have a crisis since March when, when COVID broke, but we have a crisis of governance. And the idea that you've got bond questions that you're going to put together, did, did you support the idea uh, early on to postpone the bond questions to after the election? And what are we going to do? We're going to run a special election, which is going to you know, turn out you know, 4% of the electorate to, to make a decision on hundreds of millions of dollars of spending? It, that seems absolutely insane to me. So we have had several uh, discussions about that. And I believe if, if we do the special election, it will be a mail only election. We've had a very high turnout. Uh, the Secretary of State, the Board of Elections, we've won the last three elections, the presidential primary, our person, you know, our Rhode Island primary and the general election all by mail. We've had seen record turnout. So I'm not concerned that enough of Rhode Islanders will be able to be heard on these issues. I believe any kind of a special election because of COVID and because of the hopefully the ability of, of to use CARES money, it will be a mail only election, just like we did the presidential primary. We had a high turnout for that. So I, I think it's important that, you know, commitments were made to a lot of these advocacies, the housing bond, the green bond, education bonds, uh, interest rates are at an all time low right now. And I think if you're gonna go out and borrow, now's the time to do that. And I think ultimately, we as the General Assembly, we don't make the decision, we let the voters make the decision. The legislature has been working. I know we haven't been in session, but we've been working very hard. And I'm hearing from constituents about the bonds, people who have a vested interest in the, the green economy, vested interest in education, and want to make sure that you know, the school buildings are improved and the air conditioning systems, the HVAC systems are all brought up to code. I mean, there's serious concerns. We need to look at our infrastructure. And I, I want to also be prudent about it. I don't want to max out the state's borrowing power. I want to see what, if any, is coming down the road from a so-called Biden stimulus plan, because if we get some money and that requires a match, we have to have the ability and our borrowing capacity to meet that match. So I'm prudent about them. I'm gonna work collaboratively with my colleagues, especially the House Finance Committee. Uh, Mom and Abby has been invaluable to me, get, getting me up to uh, stuff, in, in, in incorporating all of his knowledge and sharing it with me has been invaluable. But I, I think it's important that we do come back. I think it sends a strong signal to Rhode Island that we are taking this seriously. I want to work. I'm talking to my colleagues about a possibility of a, some kind of a COVID task force. We've had some good news in the last couple of days about a possible vaccine. Tempering that with the New York Times yesterday said that, uh, you know, a lot of states aren't ready to, uh, to distribute the vaccine. Who's going to get it? Uh, how many people are going to get it? We're going to give it to the inner cities. We're going to give it to the high risk people. We're going to do it to frontline workers. We need to figure all that out. And I'm going to tap into the creativity and the knowledge of the house. I'm going to work together with that. I also have a, a bunch of representatives, uh, Lauren Carson, Deputy Speaker Lima, who are looking at and studying the uh, remote voting possibilities. How can we do it legally? How can we do it? It's not just a technical thing. We have to make sure that we're following the constitution. So I have people working right now. I know it, from an outward perspective, you don't see that, but there are people, legislators in the house, I'm speaking only for the house, working ve very diligently on COVID, remote voting, and the finance committee and finance staff are helping me and Lita Blazajewski try to craft a budget that uh, serves the needs of the people, that doesn't raise taxes, doesn't cut spending. I mean, it's, it's a tall order. And I'm working really hard to try to get it done. You're talking about remote voting for legislators on bills. Are you, are you, are you suggesting that you're not going to meet in the plexiglass uh, setting that you've got at the state house right now? I, we don't know, Dan, what the pandemic is going to look like and what the surge is going to look like. It's possible that we meet in the house as it is now. And it's possible that we also meet remotely, at least for committee hearings. I just don't know. Uh, I, I am like you, I watch the governor's press conferences and I'm looking at the CDC and Dr. Fauci and we're trying to figure out where we're heading. And I, I'm concerned like everybody else. I, I am somebody with underlying health conditions and I'm concerned about uh, you know pandemic and exposure. And I don't wanna put any of my colleagues or any of the public or anybody at risk. So no, we have to I, I, do I, this smartly. Yeah, I, I get, I, I, I get that. I, that. That makes sense to me. All right, why don't we pause? Uh, lots to. You can tell that uh, Representative and now Speaker Elect uh, Sikarchi, Sikarchi has got a lot on his mind. We all do, uh, but at least there's some adrenaline flowing here, which is, and there's a pulse for this General Assembly, which is a good thing. When we come back, we'll dig into how this thing is going to operate. Stay with us. Be right back on my state of.
With State Representative and now Speaker-elect Joe Shikarchi, so uh, based on our last segment, uh, there are some, it's good to see that wheels are turning for the Speaker of the House, and I, I just think this General Assembly has been way too distant, way too tardy. Let me ask you about some operational stuff here, Mr. Speaker-elect. Are, are you are you taking over when you get back? I, 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 is the Speaker of the House, Nick Mattiello, who lost his District 15 race, going to step aside as Speaker before the end of the year? The Speaker is the Speaker until January 5th. Uh, he is uh, planning on staying there, to the best of my knowledge. He has given me, you know, uh, full authority to work with the staff and everyone else. So he's been very helpful and supportive. Um, my guess is he'll stay there, Speaker, until the, the 5th of uh, January. So... Will you be presiding over the General Assembly? I know you're working on remote, this and that. I understand, but uh, you... no, no. If, if we if we go back, if we go back and to do a budget, it will be uh, Speaker Mattiello or Deputy Speaker Lima or Deputy Speaker Kennedy. One of those three will, will run the rostrum. I am not the speaker, and I, I am not the. I don't have the authority to do so, and I would not be uh, presumptuous to try to attempt to do that. Of course, you could ask for a vote. It, it's a lame duck session, and I, I just think that the, it's proper and following protocol and diplomatic and polite not, not to do that. I can accomplish the things I need to accomplish with the support of my colleagues, both the current colleagues and the future colleagues. So I feel comfortable, and I'm not expecting any uh, pushback at all from anybody on that issue. It's, it's about getting the job done, Dan. It's not about who stands where, who sits where. It's about getting the job done, and, and we'll, well get the job done. Well, I, I, I hear you, but it's also about, it's about vision and leadership. And I will tell you, um, again, I, I can't be any stronger. I am disgusted over the General Assembly's pullback here in 2020. The Speaker of the House outgoing is as responsible for that as the Senate President is. And if that, the... the you know, you're in there already, last segment, telling me about the things you want to get done, your focus, let's go. Uh, I don't know what, I don't know what setting or what agreement these, these leaders made with this governor to let her run this place by herself. But I, I get nervous about the idea that Speaker Mattiello, uh, with his disposition for 2020, is going to be the one to start really the work at the end of 2020. So so what's the practical reality? Is he going to just play ex officio more or less while you're, you know, without the title running the show or what's going on? Well, he's given me a, a lot of latitude to uh, take over and, and craft the budget. He has contacted the governor and, and the Senate president and he's told them both to deal with me. And I appreciate that. And I thank him for that. And I am the one making the decisions and I am working collaboratively with the staff to get things done. If we pass a, a budget in the next three weeks or four, uh, four weeks, it'll be, for lack of a better word, uh, dr driven by my current leadership, not, not the old leadership. Well, let me ask you this then. You know, in November, when, when we're in December, as we're dealing with an expiration date on the current COVID CARES Act money on December 31st, if we don't have a stimulus deal that also changes the language of the former CARES Act, there's money that's going to have to be re sent back to Washington if it's not used. And I know the governor scoffs at that notion, but she's been parking money to try to fill budget gaps. There's been inflated kind of rumor that there's a $900 million deficit. She finally had to admit it's $300 million-ish for this fiscal year and 300 for the next. So those things, while not comfortable, are manageable. And you had a deficit going in before COVID anyway. Um, are you concerned with the with the execution of this COVID Act money, this CARES Act money, and the economy that has not been able to 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 to, to be um, uh, nursed with it? I mean, there are hundreds of millions of dollars. New Hampshire put four hundred million dollars into their business economy. We can't get thirty out, Joe. I mean. What are we doing with this administration to make sure that they save this economy so that you ever have a budget in the next four or five years to actually plan on? So uh, to answer your question, you're, you're exactly right about the budget deficit. The latest fiscal uh, revenue numbers came in were about $350 million. 
I have been spoken to the governor. I've spoken to the Senate president. There's been recent guidance, and we have also good fiscal numbers regarding sales tax. And I think we'll be able to close this. And I think there's going to be hundreds of millions of dollars left over. And I believe the governor, I'm not, I believe, I know the governor will not give a dime of that money back. She will spend it in the business community. I, I don't have the particulars of what which the focus is. We have oversight coming up next week with Stephen Pryor, uh, Brett Smiley, and David Warmer. And we'll find those answers out. We're going to ask them in a public setting so the public can hear them and understand them. Those are very important and detailed questions. But we need the economy to be open. I, I have a small law practice, and I represent a lot of small businesses. I hear it from the private side as much as I hear it from my uh, constituents. We, we need the, the economy to move forward and grow. I think there's been recent guidance from the U.S. Treasury, which gives us a little bit more latitude. We have to be smart. We as a state have to be smart on how we spend the money in the state budget. My understanding is it could be anywhere from one to two to $300 million left over. And the governor has assured me that she'll be spending that money on small businesses in Rhode Island. And well, for, well, for well, you know what? So far, uh, Mr. Speaker-elect, she has failed to execute the kind of plans that other state had. Uh, the Commerce Secretary has not been able to figure out how to get out of his own way to get this stuff done. Why not delegate this to Lieutenant Governor Dan McKee, who has been, who, by, to his credit, has, has driven this conversation from a desk afar? First of all, you have a potential transition. I don't know what the, what the political uh, you know, issue is going to be with Biden and whether the governor goes or what. But you've got to get that guy in the game. He's been fighting for small business the entire way. His charge is in small business. Why not bring him into the mix and, and, and make a task force around the small business channeling of another $150 million worth of grant money into the state or something along that line? Uh, I have a great respect for Dan McKee. He's a friend of mine. We have worked together on issues. We've made joint public appearances. Matter of fact, the Lieutenant Governor McKee was one of the first people to call me when the a caucus voted me in as the speaker elected. And I would enjoy him. I think Dan has been a great advocate. Some of my clients uh, uh, have been met, meeting with him on a regular basis and think Dan's wonderful and he does a good job. And, and I understand the point of view. I don't know, I'm not here to speak or defend or try to explain or figure out the relationship between the governor and the lieutenant governor. I will leave that to the, the two professionals to do that. I can tell you that I enjoy a, a good relationship. But, but, but Joe, it's, it's, it's not about their relationship. They, they don't have anything nasty between them. It's about the politics and who's what. We gotta get the we gotta get a triage program into this state. We gotta, we gotta delegate and be responsible and go. Forget the, the forget who gets along with who. That I'm hoping that the new speaker elect will come in and say, "Doggone it, we're late on some things. We've been we've given too much leash to this governor to run this thing all by herself. We're back in the game, and we got to get business done." I am not the speaker until the fifth of January, and my goal at the moment is to try to get a balanced budget out for the people of Rhode Island. That's my goal. And a budget that if, if I'm successful, that's a big if, and I'm not committed to say we're coming back, doesn't raise taxes on the small business or individuals, doesn't do layoffs, possibly preserves another year of the car tax. I mean, there's a lot of things on the table and I'm doing, I'm spending my energies to try to balance the budget and pass it in three weeks. And that's not an easy thing. And I'm rolling up my sleeves every day, Saturday, Sundays, weekends, nights, and I'm doing my best to do that, Dan. Well, uh, I would hope that uh, the CARES money gets spent well before I become the speaker. I hope all that CARES money is spent before Christmas. So uh, we're talking about 30 to 40 days from now, and I'm not in charge until then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I, I get it. Um, uh, uh, we'll have a final, uh, the, the, the full court press will end for the speaker-elect in just a couple of minutes. We'll be right back on My State of Mind. Stay with us. Elect Joe Shikarchi. Look, it's uh, he stepped into the fire here. You know, leadership is uh, leadership is hard. Never mind uh, the times that we're in. Joe, uh, you can feel my urgency. I get that you're not engaging formally until January, but this state is starving for more leadership voices other than just this governor, who I think did a great job talking down this virus in the early in the year. But do you agree with me going forward as the new speaker elect? We got to get back to a balanced form of government in COVID, out of COVID, whatever. Absolutely, yes. Simple as that.
It's as simple as that, Dan. I, I want to go back. My colleagues want to go back. We want to be there. I think it's important for the people of Rhode Island to see the General Assembly in session. We need to be back, and we need to be doing the people's business. And I'm committed to do that. And I want input from the lieutenant governor, and I want input from the governor. I want input from everybody. It's my style, a very collaborative person. I'm a good listener. I'm a data guy. I want to hear different points of view. And that will be that will drive my my tenure as speaker. I want I want to hear from everybody and then charge forward and make a decision. All right. Well, look, uh, we know what your reputation is. You do. You, you've earned the equity in the legislature for the way you comport yourself. Uh, that hasn't changed in this conversation, and I'm sure it won't change going forward. I hope, though, that that alongside the, the asset you bring in terms of your disposition, your, your, your character, and your personality, I hope that you understand that there's a mission here, not just to have, be seen in session, but to be making some better decisions transparently for this state. I mean, right now, you guys are a rumor, and you need to get back in the game. I can see how you would say that and some of the people have, but I will tell you, my colleagues, I have never worked harder as a legislator than I have this year. Never, ever. And I know I'm not in session, you don't see it, but how, how many constituents call me and call my colleagues who uh, want help getting PPE loans, want help getting unemployment, want help getting uh, appointment at the registry by online. So many things we've tried to help everybody. So we're working hard. And I am going to make sure that people of Rhode Island know how hard the General Assembly works for them. All right. That's my goal. And we hope, that we have to hope to have a continuing dialogue with Joe on both platforms on TV and radio. Uh, State Representative and Speaker-elect, congratulations. Thank you. And we'll talk. Thank you very much. All right. Thank now, Word, we come back. Stay with us. General Assembly needs to get back in the game. And it better happen quick. We need oversight. We need three branches of government operating. We need checks and balances. We need leadership. We're starving for it, COVID or not. Thanks for watching. We'll talk to you on the radio weekdays 3 to 6 on WPRO. I'm back here tomorrow night.